All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks for joining us um, tonight for another one of our Grand Round sessions. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, a HIV update and PEP and PrEP in the, the management um, of patients. Uh, we're joined tonight by Dr. Charlotte Bell, who's a sexual health uh, physician in the, at the Communicable Disease Control Branch at Adelaide Sexual Health Clinic here in South Australia. So we really appreciate her time tonight. Um, I know that I have some patients with HIV and they're looked after by specialists, but we are having more and more patients coming in, um, having high risk activity and, and wanting some of these medications. So I think it's a really good opportunity to better understand um, some of these, these medications that are out there now. So I'll, I'll pass her over to, to Charlotte. Hi, good evening, everyone. So um, the first thing I want to say is please, please, please ask a question if I'm not clear. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. So. The first slide, is it that button you press? Oops. What did I? No, if it's pushed down. Ah. Um, push. I'll push there. Oh, already having audio. <laughs> Sorry, guys, bear with us. I'm just going to stop, share, and reshare, and we'll get this fixed. So let me just fix that. Share. Um, let's go back here. Okay. All right. Great, thank you. So um, firstly, in South Australia, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, we are on the land of the Ghana people and that they are the uh, custodians of the lands and waters of the Adelaide region on which we meet today. And we pay our respect to the elders, both past and present. So um, hopefully there'll be some learning objectives. Um, we'll talk a little bit about epidemiology um, in Australia with a bit of a reference to South Australia. Um, talk about PrEP dosing, PEP, PrEP, um, you know, what to do in your local jurisdiction and um, talk about some ASHAM tools that you can find online as well. Um, so in the, the data is really out of date and I apologise for that, but everyone's only getting in their 2020 data now with the COVID uh, pandemic, all the public health units have been somewhat sidetracked. Side so um, there are about nearly um, 29,000 people um, estimated to be living with HIV. Um, in 2019, there were 903 new diagnoses and um, the highest proportion of people living with HIV um, diagnosed in Australia's history. So 90%, which is a good thing. And then 10% um, um, of people with HIV are estimated to be undiagnosed. So, um, you know, that's the group of people who we really need to work with. So as you can see, back in the beginning of time and kind of when HIV first came around at um, around about 1985, and then we developed HIV tests, of course, we had a bit of a blip with high numbers of um, people who'd been undiagnosed formally being diagnosed with HIV. Um, and then you can see um, those rates going down and it's predominantly uh, men who were diagnosed with HIV in, um, in Australia. So in South Australia, um, we have very small numbers of HIV diagnosed and I'm sorry I haven't got any kind of specific data to other states but to date we've only had 33 um, cases of HIV diagnosis here but overall the number of new diagnoses around the country in HIV are going down and we'll talk about that. So um, the reason that uh, HIV diagnoses are going down really is because of the success of PrEP. And um, GPs are absolutely perfectly placed to look after people living with HIV and also to um, look after people who um, are on PrEP. I think, you know, you, there's no one really better placed um, than GPs to look after both these groups of people. And of course, when it comes to HIV, you can share care with um, someone like a sexual health physician, someone such as myself or an infectious diseases physician, if you choose to, or you can just look after their whole um, care. So, have I gone the wrong way? Oh no, sorry, I haven't. So um, most, me most people who are diagnosed with HIV um, are men who have sex with men. And I've mentioned already that the prevalence of HIV 
um, is going down overall, but the prevalence in people who sell sex in um, Australia is extremely low. Um, you know, point, basically uh, uh, 0.3 per 100 um, people. Um, heterosexuals, again, um, the rates of infection are low and tend to be people who've migrated from overseas. Um, and um, again, that's another group that we need to target for um, HIV testing. So let's move on to what have we got for HIV? Well, we've got a whole heap of interventions. We've got um, treatments um, which, you know, stop you catching HIV in the first place. So overseas, they're trying things like microbiocides for women. This enables women who aren't particularly um, empowered in relationships to be able to use condoms. They can put gels or implants inside their vaginas and protect themselves from acquiring HIV. In sub-Saharan Africa, male circumcision has been extremely um, amazing at preventing HIV transmission. Um, and anyway, vaccines and things like that. But we're here this evening really primarily to talk about treatment as prevention for HIV, post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, and also pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So hopefully, if you're not familiar with those terms, that will become a bit clearer. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, PEP, or post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. And this is for people who um, have, you know, found themselves in a situation where they had sex and they just didn't use a condom, the condom came off, the condom broke, whatever. Um, but essentially, um, they can get um, post-exposure prophylaxis from any emergency department in Australia. If they go online, we've just discovered, to um, a website called Get Pet. There's a map and it's interactive and it can tell them where their, their nearest provider of post-exposure prophylaxis is. And um, essentially all that individual has to do is rock up to the emergency department um, discreetly. They don't want to do it in front of a waiting room, you know, because uh, unfortunately with HIV and um, th there's a lot of stigma. So they might discreetly tell the triage nurse that um, they've, uh, they're worried about HIV acquisition and they get given a starter pack for post-exposure prophylaxis and they take a tablet every day. And um, it's freely available in Australia. We're very lucky. So what do we have to do initially when we're giving out PEP? We have to assess someone to make sure they're actually at risk. And we'll discuss that a little bit more. Maybe we do a bit of counselling to explain um, how they take their treatment um, and um, what they might do in the future, for example, if um, they're at risk of HIV acquisition and um, the treatment and follow up. So I love this chart because, first of all, what we need to do is make an assessment to work out who's at risk of, um, of, um, PEP, of needing PEP, essentially. And really, it's unprotected receptive um, anal or vaginal intercourse or the use of contaminated injecting equipment if the source is known to be HIV um, infected and they're not on treatment and they have a detectable viral load or they're, fr they're, they're from a higher prevalence group. So for example, they're likely to be at increased risk of HIV. So that means um, a guy who's had sex with men or a woman who's had sex with a man who also has sex with men, for example, they're from a higher prevalence group, we give them PEP. An injecting drug user, we've done a fantastic job in Australia at, um, at um, needle exchange and preventing HIV transmission in injecting drug users. However, the prevalence in that group is around 1%. Um, as, um, and so it would be indicated in this group and also um, higher prevalence countries. And all you have to do to work out higher prevalence countries is look on the UNAIDS website and usually they give you the information around what's a high prevalence country. And a sex worker from outside Australia, then, you know, because we do see people who, for example, come back from the Philippines, we're about to open the borders, people go overseas, they might go to the Philippines or Vietnam or other sub-Saharan Africa, other higher risk um, areas. Um, high prevalence areas, I should say, and they fly back. And if it's within 72 hours, we can give them post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So essentially one plus two plus three, yes, they can have MPEP. But um, in fact, I'll talk about this first. So how does it work? Well, 
HIV infection doesn't occur instantly. There is a window period. So the principle with post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV is that at day naught, obviously you have the sex and you have the um, exposure to HIV at the mucosal membrane. So you get microabrasions, and um, if the virus is present, those, those microabrasions can get in. And um, then on day naught to two, the virus is transmitted from the um, receptors in the skin cells off to um, other kind of um, cells, such as dendritic cells, and off to the regional lymph node. Um, so what we need to do is get in there before the virus goes off to the regional lymph node. And we have a 72 hour window to do that. If you give it after 72 hours, it's futile, it won't work, all right? There's no biological plausibility for it. However, this person in front of you who comes in asking for PET may well be at risk in the future. So that's your opportunity to discuss PrEP, which we'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so PrEP and PEP. Well, there is absolutely no doubt that um, you know, we know from the evidence that to be on PrEP, so it's the, exactly the same drug, it's a blue pill, it's tenofovir and emtricitabine that you give for PEP and for PrEP, to be on it already is fantastic. It's about 99% protective if people take it properly against HIV, whereas PEP, you take it maybe 24, 48 hours after the event, so we Thing. there have been no randomized controlled trials because it wouldn't be ethical to do it. We think it's about 80% protective. So being on PrEP is the ideal. Being on PEP is the next best, getting PEP is the next best thing. So what data do we have? Because I mentioned it wouldn't be ethical to do randomized controlled trials. We know that um, back in the 90s, there was, an, there was a study looking at um, people who were exposed to needle stick injuries in PEP. Um, was seen to be about 81% protected then. We know from mothers who have babies who are HIV, that the mothers who are HIV positive, if they're not on drugs, if they get, if they um, give birth to a baby and then the baby goes, goes on medication like PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, it's protective. And these poor little macaque things have been basically intravenously, interanally, and intravaginally um, exposed to HIV, and it has shown to be protective in, these, in this group as well. So, but you need, they need to take it for 28 days. So that's part of the counseling. If you don't take it for 28 days, it's not gonna be 100%, well, it's not gonna be as effective, I should say. So any questions about PEP? There's one question in the mm. chat. Let's just have a look at that one again. Go back, can you? What is the risk of insertive exposure? Yeah, so the best thing to do for this kind of thing is when you go to, it depends um, if it's insertive exposure, the risk is around one in a hundred of someone acquiring HIV. But what I do is if someone's HIV positive already, if it's receptive, so if someone's bottom and it's receptive anal sex between men and the bottom person, if the top person is HIV positive, is about 33%. Now, what I generally do is I get online and I go to the Australian, um, um, H, I go to ASHAM, the Australian Society for HIV Medicine, and I get their um, guidelines up. And they have beautiful little charts, which I haven't taken pictures of and put on here, and maybe I should have. And essentially what that does is it gives you all the risk calculations there in a little chart. So you don't have to do any risk calculations yourself. You just go, right, yes, this guy had receptive anal sex with another guy, bang, he can have PEP. Um, this person, this guy went off to, I don't know, Hindley Street in South Australia, had sex with a sex worker, she, you know, she, there's no reason to, there's no reason to get him pet, to give him pet, but obviously there might be a lot of counselling around that and STI screening and also checking for uh, prior exposure to bloodborne viruses and um, things like blood tests for syphilis. Does that answer your question? Okay, all right. So this is um, treatment as prevention for HIV versus PrEP, all right? 
So what we really want to do is uh, we want to get away from all the stigma and all the stuff that happened back in the early days of um, HIV. So um, for those of you who are old enough to remember the Grim Reaper creeping up behind a beautiful white Australian family bowling on the, you know, bowling in the bowling alley, having a lovely family day out because everybody thought that this was going to be it. It was going to see the end of everyone. But we have a different Grim Reaper now. We have COVID-19. And this is the equivalent in, us, in the UK. I remember when I was a child, um, my grandfather was worried that he was going to get AIDS. And, you know, but everybody was absolutely frightened about AIDS. Everybody in the country got a leaflet with the AIDS iceberg on it. And it just denoted that the AIDS we were seeing at the moment was the tip of the iceberg and that everything else was underneath it. But, you know, and we were going to have we were, AIDS was just going to take over the world. Well, do you know what? Unfortunate, unfortunately, for sub-Saharan Africa, particularly, when you look at the figures, that, so these are UN AIDS figures. Um, this is 2020 data. <coughs> Excuse me. 37.7 million people were living with HIV in 2020. 1.5 million people became infected. 680,000 people died of AIDS-related illness in 2020. 27.5 million people are accessing antiretroviral therapy and 79.3 million people have been infected since the beginning of the epidemic and 36.3 million people have, have died of AIDS. So, you know, for those of us who are old enough to remember, and I, and I remember I started my first HIV job in London in uh, 1998 and I remember walking onto the ward and there were about 30 um, people who were all young and beautiful and had lives ahead of them potentially infected with AIDS and you know in 1998 a lot of them died and at, towards the end of 1998 we learned that actually you needed to have three active antiretroviral therapies, um, three anti active drugs to actually suppress HIV and now we're in the most fantastic place because this is what we have so it, please excuse this picture, but this is what I show people now. So when I started in HIV medicine, we used to give people toxic drugs. Um, they would take, you know, three or four um, tablets, three or four times a day. One of the particular med medications you had, to, every time you took it, you had to drink a litre of fluid because it would crystallise in your kidneys. <laughs> Another one of them, um, they had, you know, it would cause um, loss of fat, fat in the face and people's faces would sink away. They their body um, morphology would utterly change. And if you were a, a, a gay man, <coughs> excuse me, you went to a gay bar, essentially, um, it would be totally stigmatizing and it would um, disclose your HIV status. So now what we have is we have this amazing little box that we can bring out. And most of my patients get that little brown pill called Victavi. It's three active antiretrovirals in one pill. And um, if someone's diagnosed with HIV, they can go on that immediately. And they expect virtually no side effects. Most people tolerate it beautifully. And they should expect, you know, a normal, um, <clears throat> healthy, long life. And I think one of the other things that highly active antiretroviral therapy has given us is U equals U. So this has been a long time coming. It's been since 1998 when I mentioned that we realized how to actually treat HIV effectively and also stop mother to child transmission. And then we realized that if you were on treatment and your viral load was low, that you couldn't transmit HIV to other people. So you, if someone has HIV, I can say to them, if they're on treatment and their viral load is undetectable, I can say they absolutely cannot transmit their HIV to other people. And that has been game changing. And I think it's really reduced the whole stigma thing as well. So I might have a patient, for example, and they're living with HIV and they might meet a new partner. And then they tell their partner when they feel safe to do so that, um, yeah, I've got HIV, but I don't worry, I'm undetectable. And that may not mean anything to someone who's not that familiar with HIV and they may be completely freaked out. So they'll bring them in, hopefully, if they can get to that point, they'll bring them in and they have a chat with someone like me and I'll say, absolutely, 
you know, your partner is the safest person to have sex with without condoms from an HIV perspective. You can't catch it from them whilst they're taking their treatment and they're undetectable. And I think that's been a very important um, fact for some people. And also reducing this horrible stigma that HIV has born out of what happened in the early days with the Grim Reaper and the iceberg. So how, how can I be confident enough to say, well, we've got basically 800 uh, zero discordant couples. So we have, um, and this is in heterosexuals in, in the blue with the white circles and the white arrows, that's heterosexuals. We know that um, after 58,000 episodes of sex without condoms, there were no linked transmissions. So when I say there were no linked transmissions, there were transmissions that they weren't from the sexual partner who was taking treatment, they were from someone else. And this was obviously in the higher prevalence countries. We can't do a study like this in somewhere like Australia where the prevalence generally is low. The partner two study, however, did look at um, uh, countries such as um, the UK and Europe and the US. And essentially what they found was that, um, thanks, what they found was that um, men who have sex with men, the same is absolutely true. If they're on treatment, their viral load is un undetectable, they can't trans transmit their virus. So it's fantastic. So what about life expectancy? Well, we know that if you have HIV and it's diagnosed and you start treatment, whilst your HIV is, is kind of, you know, still um, fairly early. So ideally when your CD4 count is above, three, is above 500, you have a normal life expectancy. You should expect a normal life expectancy. My colleagues in London tell me that they have data to show now that if you have HIV and you're diagnosed early, you might live longer than HIV negative age match controls. And that's, they think that's born out of the fact that if you're HIV positive and you're diagnosed, say, when you're 40, you might do things like stop smoking or you might have your cholesterol measured more frequently, your blood pressure, all those other things that GPs do beautifully well. Um, at primary prevention. Um, so yeah, you guys are perfectly placed because the treatments are easy to prescribe, easy for patients to take and easy to tolerate. Obviously, that's completely different depending on the circumstance. And there's no doubt that um, HIV, if diagnosed late, um, or if individuals can't take their antiretroviral therapy for whatever reason, if their circumstances are too chaotic or they already have other comorbidities that might not be um, the case for them. But generally, if we can diagnose people with HIV early, we can get them on treatment and we can stop transmission and we can improve their prognosis. So what tests do we use for HIV? Well, we use the HIV um, antibody test. Now, this graph, um, I don't know if the colours come out very well, but essentially... The red line is meant to be the viral load. So the zero is where the individual catches HIV. So if you go along the bottom axis, that's time. And um, the other axis is trying to denote what happens to the viral load. So initially it peaks. The CD4 count, which is the um, green line, I think. Yes, that, that kind of drops when the viral load peaks. It recovers. And then over the course of time, usually about 10 years, it drops down. Once it's below 200, people are at risk of developing AIDS and other um, quite significant, well, mainly AIDS, but cancers and AIDS cancers, opportunistic infections, essentially. Now, the HIV test turns positive around about two to four weeks after exposure with the virus. So what happens initially is that someone might rock up to their GP with a flu-like illness, for example. And um, the GP might say, okay, so, um, you know, maybe you've got the flu or maybe you've got another viral illness. Come back and see me in a week if you know better. Well, that person might well come back in a, uh, might not come back in a week because if it's HIV zero conversion, that person will have recovered by a week. If we can catch people early, if we can catch people when they seroconvert, then um, essentially um, we can, people can remember who they've had sex with in the recent past. 
and we can get people on treatment early and that really improves their prognosis long term. So essentially, people have an, H an excellent prognosis that they're diagnosed with a CD4 count of greater than 500 ideally, but 350. People do change their behavior. So we know that 54% of transmissions come from the 25% of people who were unaware. And in fact, in, in Australia, it's probably 10% of people that they model don't know about their HIV. Um, HIV, if you're on treatment, you can't transmit the virus. And a light diagnosis of HIV has poorer health outcomes and utilizes more healthcare resources. Antenatal testing for HIV should be universal in, ev in every pregnant woman because we can reduce the risk of mother to child transmission from about 30, 35% down to about one in a thousand. And places such as San Francisco and London and places where there is active, anti, um, active um, lots of HIV transmissions will tell you they can't remember their last mother to child transmission if the mother was tested antenatally. However, that might be different if the mother rocks up in labor and she's been untested for HIV. Any questions about uh, this? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, can I ask questions? Yes, please Thank do. Thank you very much so far. That's really, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, regarding the, uh, I've got two questions regarding testing. First of all, we can see that uh, the RNA uh, is detectable um, uh, pretty much earlier than the antibody, which is uh, logical. Uh, does it mean that we can or need to ask for HIV RNA uh, at time of uh, asking the antibody in a person, maybe who is um, on PEP or sig at significant risk? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question and I'm trying to cover so much. I don't really cover the things that I should be, but you're absolutely right. I should have covered that. And essentially, look, um, so the advice is no. If you think someone's seroconverting, request an HIV test. That's all you have to write is HIV test. The reason is that the laboratory in, South, in Australia, they do um, fourth generation assays. The fourth generation assay is a combi assay. So it has the antibody and the antibody will turn positive at around six weeks. And it also has the P24 antigen. The P24 antigen will be detectable at around about two weeks after acquisition, okay? So if you really think someone may have early HIV, it will be being looked for anyway. The other thing is that the viral load, the HIV viral load in most labs, so an HIV test, you can get a result the next day or the day after. Um, because they, they usually, if it's reactive, they go on to confirm it. So it can take a day or maybe two days. However, the viral load may take a week to come back, okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing is that the viral load that we use in Australia goes down to really, really ridiculously low copies. So less than nine copies in one mil of blood, it can detect that. So if you have someone who... Um, gets sometimes you get um essentially issues with the lab you might have dirty primers or you know the test isn't and you might get a viral load of 24 and it's probably meaningless and it's probably a false positive but it causes anxiety so generally just do an hiv test so if someone walks in and they think they've been at risk of hiv pretty much do their hiv test if they're symptomatic and you think they're seroconverting, make sure they come back a week later because if that initial HIV test is negative, they need to come back at a week. If they come back at a week and their test is negative, that illness a week before was not HIV seroconversion, okay? However, obviously, they may still be at risk of HIV acquisition, so you need to make sure you test them again at about six weeks after the last high risk exposure. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, the other question is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you will uh, cover the uh, testing protocol after the exposure or uh, I need to ask now. Oh no, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I wasn't really gonna say heaps about post-exposure prophylaxis because A, because it's, it's all online. Um, but again, I, I'll absolutely cover it. So really, the main thing you have to do is an HIV test. Most people who are at risk of HIV are also at risk of syphilis. And we are 
in the midst of a syphilis outbreak across Australia now. So if you're doing an HIV, if you're doing a blood test, HIV, syphilis. The other thing to do is make sure if um, make sure to see if someone is immune to hepatitis B. If they're at risk of HIV, they're at risk of hepatitis B. So um, usually we recommend doing a surface PEP B, surface antigen core, and surface antibody. And um, if if you if you think there's been any injecting or sex between men, it's worth doing a Hep C blood test as well. And then um, if it's um, if it's sexual acquisition you're worried about um, and it's between men, we recommend a throat swab for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So guys can go off to the bathroom, they can do their own swabs, they can do their own throat swab, their own um, rectal swab and pee in a pot and check each of the three sites for chlamydia and gonorrhea. If, you've not, if you just check their urine, you miss the rectal and the throat site as well. Okay, okay. so it's important and- to check. It's, it should be uh, the protocol uh, for HIV test is the same as needle stick, which is the baseline six weeks, three months and six months. Yeah, it probably depends on which jurisdiction. But yes, in South Australia, we recommend <laughs> that exposure because really you're looking at prior HIV. You want to know if that person's already HIV positive because you might do more harm than good if you put them on PET and they're already HIV positive. OK, um, at a month. And then we do it at three months. But, you know, each individual is different. Sometimes they're very anxious. So you can amend the, um, the testing schedule um, for each individual patient. And the other thing that we always recommend as well, actually, is kidney tests. So we want to know about urea and electrolytes, particularly the EGFR. And um, we've had, we've, we have had over the years people have undiagnosed glomerular issues, for example, when they start PET, their EGFR drops right down. And um, it's actually because, um, you know, this medication can, in a very small minority of people, cause renal issues. Um, but I'm very happy um, for these slides to be shared. And I'm also very happy to um, put all those things on there, all those recommended tests. Um, but they're certainly on the national guidelines and we can share those the links to the national guidelines for PEP and PrEP for you to have a look. And they're really easy to use. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Right? Yeah. Cool. Perfect. All right, let's move on. So PrEP. What is PrEP? So it is the same tablet that you give out for PEP. And it's the tablet as well that we use for people who are HIV positive. So it's an antiretroviral tablet. It contains two active drugs, tenofovir and emtricitabine. And um, PrEP has been on the PBS since 2018, and now there's no authority required. And if you guys have got nurse practitioners working in your practice, they can prescribe it. Um, PrEP is only needed for short-term intermittent periods in a person's life whilst they're at risk of HIV. However, HIV, as we've already talked about is heavily stigmatized it's a difficult virus to live with even though the prognosis is excellent and the um, in fact I was in clinic this morning and I had a nurse practitioner who's doing their S100 for HIV prescribing sitting in the um, clinic and um, the patient I was with asked the nurse practitioner what kind of work he does and he says oh I do a lot of prep but I want to start prescribing for HIV and this patient said, yes. And he's only in his early 30s. He said, yes, I was just a bit too late for PrEP. I was a bit too early for PrEP. I think PrEP was PrEP came out about three months after and he would have been on PrEP. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, it really, really works. I'm not going to go through all the clinical trials. Please believe me there. It has been trialed all over the world in large open label international Um, randomized, double-blinded, controlled trials. It's really been studied and it definitely, definitely, definitely works if it's taken properly. I wanted to show you the PROUD pilot study. This was um, in the UK and um, this was, um, I think it was about 2017. And what happened was that they um, got men who were having sex with men who walked into a sexual health clinic and that they'd had unprotected anal sex in the um, last 90 days and they planned to in the future. So they randomized them to receive the 
PrEP, which is the true VADA, immediately. So 267 went into the immediate arm, and then 256 went into the arm when they were going to go on PrEP after 12 months. They were followed up three monthly, and the plan was for 24 months. Anyway, after the interim analysis, they decided to abandon the study because in the deferred arm, so the people who were going to get PrEP after 12 months, there were 20 infections. In the immediate arm, there were three infections. The three infections consisted of one person who was already HIV positive at the very beginning of the study and two who didn't take it. So, I mean, you know, I mean, they, obviously they did non-treatment analysis, which is the right thing to do, but there were no um, HIV um, positive individuals who were taking PrEP in the, in the immediate arm and were taking it already and weren't HIV positive at the beginning of the study. So how many people are on PrEP already? Well, um, we think that there's probably about, you know, there's probably about 40,000 people around Australia. We're not quite sure, um, but uh, certainly there are lots of people who are getting PrEP. People presenting for PrEP, people coming into your surgeries asking for PrEP, typically are high risk and certainly should be assessed. And, um, you know, please consider giving them PrEP. And um, there, there will be um, sexual health physicians and um, people who are really experienced with PrEP who can hold your hand through the first consult or two and help you interpret the results. I know around South Australia, I've got a number of GPs who email me regularly with bits and bobs, you know, whilst they're just finding their feet. And then, you know, because it's so protocol driven, it's actually really quite straightforward once you know how. And I know it's easy for me to say that, but I promise it is after, after a few patients, you really get the swing of it. So this is uh, the curve showing from the beginning of time in 2017, the number of people who are taking PrEP around Australia. So what are the steps? Well, this is the ASHAM guideline. So this is available online. It's very, very detailed, um, but it's excellent. So if you really want to know more about PrEP, go here. Um, I was on the guideline writing committee, and let me tell you, we really worked hard to make sure that we had the most contemporary guidance at that point in time and that we scrutinised the guideline. However, if you don't choose to um, go through that guideline, and I don't really don't want to, there is this other thing, which again, the first time I saw it, I went, whoa, that looks really scary. But it's available online. And if you follow, if you go to line, num if you go to number one and follow down, it really helps you work out if that patient is in front of you, who is eligible for PrEP, number one. Number two, whether or not that person is clinically suitable. Again, you might think there's a lot of information there, but it is really straightforward to use. Number three, um, it talks about other testing. And number four, it talks about how you prescribe it. And number five, it talks about ongoing monitoring. When you flip it over, it gives you a nice chart at the bottom of um, which tests you do and when, okay? And which are the high risk routes as well. OK, so I think I do think that tool is useful. If you are considering prescribing PrEP, have that as your prop next to you and you can just go through it. I mean, you know, patients, patients tell me they're delighted when their GPs um, are willing to um, prescribe them PrEP because, you know, having that holistic care rather than just having to go to, you know, your PrEP provider for PrEP and your GP for your other things, if you can just get that holistic care in one place, it's fantastic. So the steps in prescribing PrEP, so initially, I'm going to run right over time here, you assess um, their eligibility, and I'm going to go on, I'm going to say, um, let's, so I'm going to answer these, so answer yes or no to the following, um, if someone's had receptive anal sex with a male partner of unknown status, and they plan to have condomless anal sex in the next three months. Do you think they get PrEP? They're eligible? Yes, yes. yes they're eligible. And um, what about number two? Condomless intercourse with a heterosexual partner, unknown status from a country with a high prevalence of HIV and multiple episodes of condomless sex over the next three months proposed. What do you think? Yes. Yes, that's a yes. 
Uh, a male having sex with a sex worker in Australia. That'll be a no, remember. And um, male having condomless sex with an HIV positive man who's got an, a sustained undetectable viral load. No, he doesn't need it. But you know what? Sometimes we give it um, just initially till they get that confidence and they've done enough reading just to enable them to feel relaxed enough to have sex and not worry. So what are the steps? Well, we want to know that um, someone's HIV negative before they start PrEP. But you don't need to wait for that HIV test. You just need to um, make sure that they haven't got any signs or symptoms of acute HIV um, infection. They've got normal renal function and they're not taking any other nephrotoxic medication. We'll go through that a bit more. Um, if a patient is HIV negative, but has had a high risk exposure in the last 72 hours, you guys know now, to, well, I'm sure you did before, but you can send them off to your local ED or get them to go online and look at get PEP and find out where they can get their PEP, okay? So they can start PEP, or you can rapidly start them on PrEP if they prefer. If their plan was to go on PrEP, you can rapidly start them on PrEP as PEP, um, but you do need to follow them up um, at a month just to make sure that an HIV test at a month is negative and just to make sure they're going okay. Um, I'm not gonna go through the Adelaide bits and bobs there, what to HIV test you order? Well, we've already talked about that. We said it's the fourth generation test, but you just write HIV on your, on your blood form. And the window period we've discussed as well, it's about two to six weeks, okay? Usually it will be positive by 10 days after exposure, but you can't reassure someone they're negative. You need to do the window period tests as well, okay? Which really is six weeks is reassuring and they say three months, but six weeks is very, very reassuring. Uh, confirm there's no signs or symptoms. What might you think of when you're looking for acute HIV? Well, flu-like symptoms, essentially. They might have a rash. They may have no symptoms at all, but I do know there was a study in the UK and they found that 90% of people with acute HIV went to see a healthcare provider, be it ED or a GP or wherever they went. And 90% were sent away without being with their HIV being diagnosed. And acute HIV is, you know, I know that you guys probably see, well, no flu at the moment, but you, you probably will when the borders open up. But do think if someone could be at risk, think of doing an HIV test. Um, side effects, well, nausea, maybe initially, I tell people to take it with food. Um, a bit of weight loss, believe it or not, it's got azetamide type effects. It, stops absorption of fat it can cause um, beneficial effects to cholesterol anyway it can also uh, cause a bit of dizziness and that kind of thing but generally these side effects are really short-lived and very very small um, reduction in EGFR and bone density so um, essentially you shouldn't prescribe PrEP to someone if their EGFR is less than 60. Um, we do um, and we do it cautiously in conjunction with assessments by renal physicians. Um, so just refer someone if their EGFR is less than 60. We've got someone who's on the transplant list who's on PrEP. He's on Descovy PrEP, which is a more bone um, kidney friendly version, but it's not on the PBS. So he imports it. That's a long story. But, you know, he, he would either acquire HIV um, or go on PrEP. And he's fine. He's been on PrEP for ages now. So this data is just to show that there is a very subtle decline in EGFR when people go on PrEP, but we don't think it's clinically significant. However, when you get older, the decline is greater. So this is a bit of a, a baffling graph, I realise. However, if you look at the right red line, that is in people under the age of 40. And you can see as, people in, uh, as people's adherence to PrEP improves, there's a very small decline in EGFR. However, if you're over the age of 50 and particularly over the age of 60 and more so, so it's a cumulative effect, if you're older, then your EGFR may decline more. So, um, you know, if someone's 25 and on PrEP and they've got no comorbidities, you may only measure their EGFR um, at baseline six months later and at 12 months. 
However, if you've got someone who's got high blood pressure, comorbidities, maybe they've got um, albumin in their urine, you may want to check their EGFR a bit more frequently. Um, so we know we've talked about this. The minimum EGFR is 60. All right. What are examples of nephrotoxic medication? There are very few of them. Um, really, Voltaren, so diclofenac, is kidney poison. If you give it with tenofovir, which is one of the PrEP um, components of PrEP, it really can do people's kidneys in. Aminoglycosides, there is a, sorry, I should, before I skipped on, there is a website called, if you Google HIV medicine and Liverpool, it gives you drug interactions for practically everything. So when I'm prescribing antiretrovirals for people, I always go on that website to make sure that um, there aren't drug drug interactions there. Um, so the steps in you need to assess for STIs and hepatitis. So hepatitis A, B, and C, pharyngeal, anorectal, and urine sample testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV serology. Um, hepatitis B, is it safe? Yes, but if, you're, if someone already has hepatitis B and they want to go on PrEP, please liaise either with a sexual health physician, their hepatologist, or an infectious disease um, physician first. The only thing we don't want them to do is go on event-based PrEP. Um, confirming a hepatitis B status, we did discuss that a bit before. We want surface antigen, hepatitis um, B core antibody, and their surface antibody and vaccinate them if they're not immune. It's free um, to people who are high risk for um, hepatitis B, including men who have sex with men and people from endemic parts of the world. Um, and I've already mentioned that. Hepatitis C, what do we um, order? Well, we order a hepatitis C antibody if that's positive. We can um, get a hep C RNA, and hep C is another one of Australia's massive success stories. We now have curative, virtually side effect free treatment for hepatitis C. We're so lucky. All right, bones. Well, you guys know better than me how to assess bones, right? So, really, what's the issue with bones? Well, we know that um, it can cause a little bit of a reduction in bone mineral density. So for example, if we have a 16 year old male who wants to start PrEP and we know his bones aren't fully formed and you know, we'll look at, we'll talk to him about PrEP and we'll, um, we'll also talk to him about other things like weight bearing exercise and smoking and all the stuff that you um, GPs know about. And um, you know, just give him the facts and enable him to make a decision about whether or not he wants to go on PrEP or not. Um, assess in pregnancy. Again, it's a risk benefit analysis. If someone is really super high risk for HIV acquisition, pregnancy is also a high risk time in a woman's life when she's at increased risk for HIV acquisition. So if she needs PrEP, please consider it and do it, you know, with, um, with specialist um, input. Um, daily PrEP. Now, um, we did use um, until about a year or so ago, probably two years ago, we used daily prep. So that meant that people took a tablet every day for seven days. After seven days, they would be told, yes, you can start having unprotected sex and you carry on taking that every day for as long as you want to stay on your prep, be it three months, six years, 10 years, whatever the scenario. When you want to stop your prep, you just need to take a month after. However, the French, they did a fabulous innovative study which showed us that men who have sex with men, when that's the risk of acquisition for HIV, they can do a two plus one plus one. That means that they can take their PrEP, where are we? They can take their PrEP two to 24 hours before um, sex, a dose 24 and 48 hours after, and that's it, okay? Now, um, it's easy. So what they can do on a Friday night, for example, if they think, right, I'm gonna get on Grinder or I'm gonna go to the bar where I think I might have sex, they can just take the two tablets. If they have sex, great, they can take the 24 and 48 hours after. If they don't, don't bother with the other pills. And that's fantastic. And it's really useful for people who can predict when they might have sex, people who, um, have um, high risk sex, but less 
than two episodes a week. OK, so there are specific criteria with that, but that's all on those um, on those big sheets that um, Asham have for you. This is if uh, someone uh, has sex and then has more than one episode of sex. So maybe they wake up in the morning and have sex or maybe find someone else the following day. Then they just need to keep going for 24 and 48 hours after. So they have their two pills, an additional pill for the additional 24 hours they have sex. And then if there's less than seven days be between the last pill and the next one, they don't have to do that double dose. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this. Yeah. There's no, no streamline required. And I just wanted to bring this up because I know some of you work in student um, general practice, um, general practices, and um, you will have international students and maybe they'll come and ask you about PrEP. Um, and, you know, one of the growing um, cohorts of HIV acquisition are international students and our, you know, our borders are about to open. And what, you know, just to make a horrible sweeping generalization, which I hate doing, but sometimes people come from parts of the world where, um, you know, it might not be socially acceptable for them if they're a, a guy to have sex with other guys and they come to Australia and it's completely acceptable. So, you know, and they might not know so much about that. They may not know as much information. And, you know, you guys are the people who hopefully, hopefully can support them. But if they want PrEP and they can't afford it, um, they could go to their sexual health service. Um, I think that if they've got insurance, which they should have, they can uh, bill their insurance company, but they can import their PrEP importantly because they won't be eligible on the PBS, but they can go to the PrEP Access Now website and they can prove that they're a student to this website and they can get free coupons. They can get free PrEP from this website uh, or they can import it and it's about $23 a month if they can afford that. If they can't afford the $23, PrEP Access Now um, will help support them get free PrEP. And I think interstate, there are some projects where you can just get free PrEP. The people are very lucky. All right, um, side effects we've discussed. I'm not going to go through that anymore. This is the website for the drug-drug interactions when um, you want to start someone on PrEP and you're not quite sure um, about their medications. You monitor them every three to six months for kidney function. And, um, you know, generally most people get on beautifully well with PrEP. Um, occasionally there are issues, but, um, you know, really the key is experience. If they take it, it's really highly effective. OK. Um, what we do is um, I don't generally see people at a month. I generally see people three months later and I just do an assessment on how they're getting along. And in fact, you can do teleconsults with people on PrEP if, if you choose to, providing they can have their STI checks every three months and they can have their HIV and syphilis blood test at a local pathology provider. And of course, you get the results and follow those things up. We've been doing a lot of um, telehealth with PrEP and I think there's a GP um, somewhere in New South Wales who sees people from South Australia via tele telehealth as well. So there are ways in which people can innovate to improve access for PrEP. Okay, so I'm not going to talk to you about cases because I've gone way over time. No, you're fine. You're absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I just hope that that wasn't far too quick and I probably rambled a bit too much initially, but please, have you guys got any questions for me? If, you, if you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can just um, take the microphone off. Um, we're happy to answer questions. If you don't want to, if you don't have any questions, then I'm sure um, we can just run through a case or so. Maybe there's no one left. They're all asleep. No, no, They've no. passed out. Can I ask about? <laughs> Oh, yes, definitely. Syphilis. So I really, really, really I'm, I want to come back and talk to you all about syphilis because that's my big thing at the moment. Across Australia, we have a big outbreak of syphilis. And um, in every state, I'm not quite sure about um, Well, I can certainly say for sure that um, in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and WA, and the Northern Territory, of course, we have babies now dying of congenital syphilis, and we have um, 
we have babies being born with congenital syphilis and it should not be happening in a in a you know country such as Australia it's a sentinel event so yes it's very important we have a real issue with syphilis the testing that we have unfortunately if the window period is three months to conclusively say to someone that they haven't acquired syphilis so let's say I go out tonight have sex if I'm lucky enough and then I'm worried about syphilis you cannot reassure me until three months goes by and that I haven't acquired syphilis however if someone rocks up with an odd looking ulcer or multiple ulcers typically if they're painless you can swab those ulcers or if they have a rash you know if they're feeling fluey rash all over the body palm sole funny lesions in the mouth swab those lesions and with with a dry swab and send it off for syphilis PCR and the syphilis PCR can be um, positive at nine days after acquisition so um, people um, can present you know as early as a week after acquiring syphilis with primary syphilis and then typically a couple of months later um, up to six months later with sec with secondary syphilis and secondary syphilis is when people have that rash flu-like illness headache um, in South Australia, and I know in other states, because I'm in national meetings, we have people now being affected with, um, you know, going blind in one eye, for example, and it's not being realised that actually it's ocular syphilis. Um, and, um, you know, people, people having biopsies because they think they've got perianal cancer or they've got vulval cancer, but actually it's just syphilis. We had a, an older man the other day, he had, the dermatologist couldn't get on top of his rash and he the steroids weren't working and he had a biopsy and the pathologist went, yep, yeah, it's teeming with treponemes. He's got secondary syphilis. So it really is out there. Please, please, please think of Graham, Graham just asked a question about yes. the swab. Is the swab a, do you write syphilis PCR? Yeah, syphilis, just write syphilis PCR and tell them where you've swabbed. So tell them that you've taken a swab from a rash or an ulcer um, and, um, you know, Typically, they're, they're painless, these ulcers, so try and get a good swab. You won't, it's not like herpes, where um, they're agonising and the pain is disproportionate to the actual ulcer. Um, these Which, are painless because they, they basically affect the sensory neurons pretty early, so the sensory neurons to that ulcer are dead, so they have no sensation in them. That's why often people don't know they're there. Yeah, but which actual swab do I use? A dry swab, a dry swab. So just a so I've got several dry swabs in my room. I've got I, one if someone's got a cut leg and it's infected. Yeah, and that's I've got a, an S and Amy's or a charcoal. And, and no. I, then yeah. I've got a PCR swab. That you mean a herpes dry. PCR? Is that a herpes PCR? Frozen. So the ones we yeah. send off, and I'm, 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 I'm talking from my ivory tower of the sexual health clinic, of course we have them. And I recognize when yeah. I work in the infectious diseases unit, we never have them, all right? So, you know, I realize that, but, but the, the gold standard swab to send is a dry swab. So um, if you are able yeah. to swab and put it in a container with no yeah. medium in it, that is the ideal. Yeah. So, but it doesn't matter which dry swab I use because no, some no. are cotton flogged and some are Dacron and some are all sorts of other funny things. No, any, any dry swab will do. They just want a dry swab. Right on. Thanks. We've got another question about uh, PrEP. So if someone is on PrEP and became positive HIV, what is the difference between PrEP and positive HIV antivirals? Yeah, good question. So um, if someone's taking PrEP and they're taking it properly, they won't catch HIV. If someone's stopping their PrEP and starting their PrEP and has rubbish adherence, that is a risk. So they're better off not taking PrEP because, um, as you quite rightly say, it won't suppress their virus properly because the blue tablet, the Truvada, the PrEP tablet you're going to prescribe, only contains two active antiretrovirals. And we know from the study in 1998 that stopped all those um, beautiful young people dying of AIDS we know we need three active antiretrovirals. It's not strictly true now, but really we need three um, active antiretrovirals. So um, tr the PrEP will not suppress their virus. So that's part of the counselling is making sure that people take it properly according to um, the way, you know, the way it's meant to be prescribed. 
Okay, good question. Um, and so say you've got a patient who, you know, high, you know, um, male, having sex with male, mm. post-COVID, about to go to Thailand for six weeks, mm. he's better off being on PrEP for the whole period rather than taking it where he, you know, if he can't plan his actions over there. Well, that's right. So if he, if he thinks he might have sex every night or all day, every day, or, then can't predict. He, or can't predict, he should go on it every day. Absolutely. And men who have sex with men um, who aren't injecting, so just men who are having sex with men, only that group, um, they should they can take two tablets two to 24 hours before their sex and then they're protected. Whereas every other group, so if it's an injecting drug user or a heterosexual man who's going off to have sex with sex workers overseas or yeah. with a partner overseas, whatever the scenario, or a woman, um, they need to go on it for seven days before and they need to take it for 28 days after their last high-risk exposure. Men who have sex with men can go on it by taking two tablets, have as much sex as they want for as long as they want, and then when they go to stop it, they take a tablet 24 and 48 hours after their last high-risk exposure because we have amazing data to show that that's a highly efficacious and protective way of taking PrEP. Perfect, thanks. Oh, when you asked about the window period for um, hepatitis C, usually three months, um, and you can do liver function tests, but um, usually it's three months. Yeah. The ALT is a good predictor for early hep C as well, if someone's been at risk of injecting. Okay, any more questions, guys? No, we'll take that as a no. Well, thanks so much for your time tonight, Charlotte. That was great. I'm sure we'll no doubt we'll have you back early next year for your syphilis presentation. Yes, please come and listen to syphilis. <laughs> um, and if, if we can share these slides also with oh, our group, course, that'd be great. Absolutely. I know it's been recorded and people can watch it, but even just to share those slides is really positive. But no, we really appreciate your time. That was perfect. Thanks okay, so much. You're welcome. Thank you guys for listening. Okay. Thank you. See you guys.